Welcome everyone to the Contact Center Perspectives podcast. I'm Steve McDonald, your host. Today we have a super interesting guest and topic. We have on Chris Rojas, and Chris, you are the head of U.S. customer service at Raisin. You've been in the business for about a couple of decades or so, I'd say now. But one of the things that is really interesting about your background, because you've started from the ground up, blank sheet of paper, two, three different times over. You've had the opportunity to rethink and say, here's how we should lay out operations in our customer support teams. And today, that's what we're talking about. What are the key lessons that we can learn from going through that multiple times that we can take forward as executives in the customer support industry and customer service industry that we can use in our daily operations and our thinking? Because one of the biggest things that we've got to do continually is fight that perception of us as a cost center versus a tremendous value center for the organization. So I'm really excited to get in here today. But first, if you wouldn't mind maybe explaining a little bit more about your background before we get started. Sure, I'd be happy to, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me on. When you say a couple of decades, it takes you back a little bit, but it's true. I've had the privilege of working with a number of great companies in this industry, building and leading a team at S&P Capital IQ, growing a team at national debt relief, taking on a pretty simple organization and building that up 10x and adding to their capacity. And now currently as the head of customer service for Raisin, I am responsible for a number of high net worth individuals who are not super comfortable with technology, who are getting out of their comfort zone to leverage Raisin's savings marketplace to maximize their interest. So I'm in the business of both creating great experiences to get these folks comfortable, hold their hands through the process, and then do it in the right way where we are partnering with our teams internally and collecting all the data that we need to continue to build out on what's been a phenomenal story for us here for the last five years in the U.S. Fantastic. I'd love to start at like the top level. What are the key lessons? What are the things that is right away going through this process that you'd want to let us know about? Building from ground up, from scratch, blank sheet of paper, however you want to call it. How would you get us started on this conversation? When you start from the beginning, the first question that you need to answer with your partners is, what is the purpose of customer service in this organization? Because it could just be answering questions. It could be about customer retention. It could be, I know that I'm going to have serious technical gaps and I need this human capital to fill those gaps and keep our customers comfortable. It could be, look, let's just keep complaints away and we'll handle everything else as best we can. It could be a number of different things. You've got to get aligned with all the other stakeholders in the beginning and make sure that everyone understands what you want the team to be. Once you are aligned on that framework, and by the way, that framework doesn't always have to stay the same. It can change. It can be negotiated down the line, but you've got to start somewhere. Once you have that framework, then you can think about, I know all of the things that customer service traditionally needs to do. I have an idea of my end state, my long-term goal, the levels of sophistication, the functions I need to execute on. What am I prioritizing along the way? What am I doing with the budget that I have to start with? And how do I begin to put those pieces into place so that I can be ready when we all agree it's time to be ready to handle the most important tasks and then build out all of that functionality as time goes on. So it's not just answering the questions. It's also the quality assurance piece. It's the data piece. It's are we only inbound? Are we going outbound? What channels are we covering? All of those different elements, you need all of those in place in order to create those great experiences and meet that expectation. And then over time, as your business thrives, and I've been lucky enough to work at places where they have found success, when you can build that data-driven case that says, we're being successful in this way, we could be even more successful if 
we had this tool set or we focused on this area. You go back to your partners and say, can we all agree this is a good use of those time and those resources and move from there? So I think you got to know who you want to be. You have to have that dialogue with your partners. And then you just have to stay laser focused on here's where I want to get and here's the path to getting there. And use that as your North Star as you continue to build out that organization. And I love that because you started out by saying, we're going to be collaborative. The reason why at the very beginning I brought up that there's still, unfortunately, in this day and age, the perception that contact centers, support centers are cost centers, large overhead because a lot of employees. So how do you, at the beginning, where many times others in the organization that you're collaborating with has have about this degree of bandwidth, what they think you are and they think you can do in terms of benefit to the organization where it's like this. You have the voice of the customer. You can help sales and marketing and product development and operations and the website and all kinds of different departments within the company. So when you're collaborating, are you also selling or promoting the benefits and how we can work with you as well? Is that a part of that game plan? I've been lucky enough to work with smart enough people that if you're selling it, they can smell the sales pitch. But what is always important is to understand the tension that your colleagues is addressing or are addressing over time. So for instance, if I think about marketing and I think about acquisition costs for customers. And you think about what it costs to convert a prospect to a paying customer. If we can add to that investment by 10%, but increase the chances that we're going to retain that customer by 50% or 75%, then I've made that data-driven case for customer service because I'm helping to decrease your market spend. You're increasing the lifetime value of that customer, which is all in the overall metrics. The ICP, the ideal customer profile, is the customer that comes and stays. So that's one of the most important revenue contributors that a contact center can make. You're also cross-selling and you're upselling. You're dealing with people that are considering buying and that don't know necessarily the breadth of services. What you just brought up, I think, is one of the most important areas. And then tying the contact center on a data basis to the overall revenue of the organization. That connection is not made very clear in most organizations, unfortunately. So is that a part of your reporting and building from ground up, knowing that part of what we're, our KPIs and what we're doing and contributing to the overall revenue of the company, I have that in mind. I have that when I'm collaborating with the other organizations. Is that a part of the mindset that you're thinking? For sure, it's feeding the data back to the organization. So not just the numbers of calls and the handle time and the abandon rate, but also qualitatively, what is your customer satisfaction and what's the commentary behind that, the underlying commentary that you're getting from customers so you can hear about those points of friction and work towards eliminating them. Separately, you want to be able to identify customers that are potentially going to get to that ultimate component of the customer life cycle and that are going to become your advocates and your evangelists, the folks who you can maybe give a little bit of extra love and attention and spotlight to and put them to work talking about how phenomenal you, your service, your product, what it is that you are offering. Get that out to folks. If you can bring that data to your team, and they can leverage that to help maintain and grow those relationships. Again, you're driving a ton of value to the organization. You're driving a ton of cost savings to the organization. And you're reminding everyone that as the eyes and the ears to the consumer, that you're not just a cost center like has been seen in the past. I love this focus on data because when it gets up to the C-suite and to the board, and they're looking at cost, and they're looking at allocations of funds, and they're looking at return on investment in the short term. They're looking at this quarter's quota versus next quarter's quota. That's where this data really, really helps. But you also just brought up really important part. There's the qualitative side. You have the ear 
of the highest authority in the business. There is no higher authority than the customer. So how does the qualitative side come in play here? That's a huge part of the reporting, the demonstrating of we're not a cost center, we're, we're a value center. So I understand the data side, how you do that. From a qualitative perspective, how does that work? So at the beginning, you need to have a sense of who you want to be, what level of service do you want to provide as an organization? Think about those other experiences you have in life and try to, in your mind and in the minds of your colleagues, your team, whoever it is you're working with, what's that service experience that you want to create? So at Raisin, for instance, trust, care, warmth, these are the maxims that we bring to these interactions because folks are clicking on their devices and they are sending around six figures through electronic payments just because they are looking to maximize their interest and stay ahead of inflation. If you're not making them feel great about the people that they're working with and the systems that they're using and the partners that they're partnering with, then you're going to lose them. And all of that time and effort to get them on board is going to be gone. So you need those principles up front. Once you have those, then you need to make it crystal clear to everyone, how do we get to that point? What does that great interaction look like from the way that we introduce ourselves in automated ways to the customer, to that first words that come out of an agent's mouth? or the first greeting that comes out when they're sending an email and chat, the tone that they're using, either in their writing or vocally along the way, making sure that folks feel heard, all of those different elements as you work through those interactions. You need to pay careful attention to them, just like you also need to pay careful attention to the legal and compliance aspects of those interactions, just like you need to pay careful attention to the policy and procedure aspect of those interactions. Customers need to feel great. We need to follow the rules. And most importantly, we need to make sure that we are giving people the right answers and solving problems in the right way. So I'm going to take two things that you've said in the last six or seven minutes, put them together and ask you a question about it. You talked about what can we do if marketing the cost of acquisition was X, but if we could help extend the lifetime value to very, very much and tied directly to revenue. And then to summarize, you're like, we need to make our customers feel great. Well, Gartner, McKinsey, they've all put out studies that have said that in today's day and age, the most important competitive advantage for companies is CX. That with rapid technological change, we can't stay ahead, our platform, our technologies. It's so easy to innovate on a product today. And we have so many competitors and we don't necessarily want to be a low cost leader. So product and price are very typical things that are competitive advantages, but those have eroded over the last years. So when you say we got to make the customer feel great and we can extend the lifetime value of that customer, it's exactly what McKinsey was talking about. She actually talked about how it contributes to the overall value all the way up through stakeholder value the stock price in all kinds of ways that you measure value in an organization. So here's my question. What do you think about CX, customer experience, as the most important competitive advantage for businesses today? I'm a little biased working in this part of the world, but throughout my career, have believed in customer experience as a differentiator. Think about the restaurant experience. Think about going to a posh restaurant, getting a delicious meal and not feeling loved, wanted, desired, special, as opposed to going to your favorite neighborhood place and getting a reliable meal, getting it from a server who genuinely cares and smiles and makes eye contact and is attentive. And they might make a mistake, but they apologize and they work hard to deal with it. They might not know the answer to a question, but they'll own it, they'll go ask, they'll get you the right answer, and they'll make you feel like they gave you a confident answer. One line that I've always used when teaching is 
Imagine you're going to a restaurant and you say to the server, I'm allergic to garlic. Is there garlic in this dish? And the response you get is, oh yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's no garlic in this dish, as opposed to, you know what, I'm not 100% sure. Let me go check with the chef and I'll be right back. And they go check with the chef and they come back and say, I just spoke with chef and he confirmed there is no garlic whatsoever in this dish. Two very different experiences, but it just goes to show the importance of that knowledge, that trust, and how that creates a differentiated experience. What you're getting can be awesome, can be pristine, can be perfect, but if it's not delivered to you in the right way that gives you the right feeling, those folks are going to have a tough time staying around. Absolutely. Short story, we just changed the company that services at our home, our heating and air conditioning system. So they called up before the appointment and said, it's going to be 15 minutes before we get there. Is there a place that is best for us to park when we arrive? And I'm going to be going by a Starbucks. Can I get you a coffee on the way? I've never heard that before. I have no idea if that has anything to do with how good they are at HVAC, but it just set them apart and they're very gracious. So there's sometimes very little that we know as consumers or even B2B buyers in terms of how we can differentiate between the companies. But the experience of working with those companies is always a major differentiator. So I want to switch directions now and say, this all sounds great, but there are many challenges to building an organization. What are the challenges that you've seen building and then going again and building and then going again and building? What are the challenges that we should always be looking out for? And how did you get around them? Okay, well, going through the memory banks over a couple decades, I've worked with companies that have had very different customer bases. And I know that those different customer bases have informed our choices greatly. So mm. Raisin, typically with the folks that are doing a lot of cash saving, they're a little more affluent, they're a little more mature. Some of them are a little more technically sophisticated. Some are getting out of their comfort zone for yield. National debt relief, more of a financially vulnerable audience. They're feeling the pinch. It's why they were looking to MDR for help in order to help them get out of the challenges that they were facing. And then at S&P, this was a business to business transaction serving a lot of financial services professionals, a lot of folks at the analyst and associate level that were more technically savvy, but they had seniors that were chasing them to use that market data and solve problems. The point being that I think the first thing you're thinking about is how do you meet those customers where they are? In the case of Raisin, where you have customers that are used to going into a branch, they may want that personal touch. And that's why when we built out that team, the focus was on email and voice for starters, and eventually adding on chat as a convenience feature. Because that customer, they wanted to speak to a human and feel like they weren't just sending their cash into the ether. That's always been a huge component is trying to meet your customers where they are, depending on who they are. Then you also working in smaller organizations, you never have endless resources at your disposal in order to solve for challenges. So you want to be as technically savvy as possible. You want to hire the best people, but you have to make choices. Just about every adult needs to do. You've got a budget and you've got expenses and you've got things you want. Am I going to go for the better system? How am I going to allocate those resources today? How do I want to allocate them over time? And then how am I measuring the success of those choices in order to say, do I press on with this? Do I make a decision? So I think being smart about resources has always been super important just because you have limitations all the time and making sure that you have a clear understanding of how well those resources are being used. That's also been a big thing that I've thought about. And then lastly, in these dynamic organizations, sometimes you may think you're going to zig, but the organization is that. So for instance, earlier this year, Raisin launched a convenience feature that allowed customers to more easily move between different savings products. It's called the Raisin Cash Account. Now, regardless of what was in the big grand plan, 
the bottom line is that we had a lot of customers who needed to have their hands held and have explained to them how to use this new feature and why this new feature would benefit them and all of those other things along the way. So in these dynamic organizations, sometimes if you're just told or by events external to you and your plan, this is what's coming, this is what you need to prepare for, and that's okay. That's your job as a senior leader, partnering with the rest of the organization in order to create these great experiences. So understanding the people first, because you're building an organization to meet the needs of a very individual group of people. That makes perfect sense. And then aligning with the needs of the organization. So how does that then play into your thoughts of team development and specifically with the agents and you're not alone in having a group of individuals that you're serving that want to be able to talk to a human. But AI is coming in and there's this great promise that it's going to take a lot of the load off of us. Team development, balance with AI and that technology. How do you think about that? I think AI is a great enabler. I think the next phase of customer service is an agent that can handle five to 10 X the customer base they can today, because there is automation that can take what the customer is saying or doing, look at the customer's history and account, whatever else they're doing, serve up suggestions to an agent, which they can deliver on their own or potentially on its own AI can deliver those answers and really put an agent in a better position to solve for that customer. So that's where I see the next phase of it, not eliminating the people, but empowering the people to do a lot more. And I think in that way, you're creating better service, but you're also living up to that promise of efficiency that this technology can bring. So that's where I see it going next. As far as team building goes, I think on an individual level, I am one of those people that gets genuine pleasure from helping others. And I firmly believe that there are other people out there that are like that, that get a charge from helping a person solve a problem, feel better. Oh, I was so worried about this and now I feel great. Thank you so much. You've been such a big help. I get a physical, personal feeling of joy. And I firmly believe that there are lots of other people in the world that are like that. So when we're looking for folks, we want people who do genuinely take pleasure in helping others and who are going to be great teammates. And if I can optimize for those two things, and I have an individual that has some of the basic and me listening, learning, communication tools, I will challenge myself to teach this person my industry, my process, my policy, and everything else. I think it's helpful if you know something about banking and payments, that's great. But I can teach you that. What I cannot do is I cannot teach you to like helping people. I cannot teach you to be a kind, caring, considerate teammate. I can try, but I can't. I don't believe in my ability to do that. I do believe in my ability to teach the business. So from a frontline perspective, and even from a team lead perspective, I want people who aren't leading in service because they saw that as the next step in their career progression. I want to make more money, so I'm going to become a team leader. No, it's someone who leads from the perspective of, I want to help these people succeed. I get pleasure from helping people maximize their potential. The leadership piece, not the management piece. I always think of the management piece as scheduling and payroll and all of the muck that you need to deal with as a grown up. But the leadership piece, being a coach and inspiring and creating an environment where people are gonna be successful, I want other folks who are with me, who are believers in what we're doing, wanna help people who wanna help people maximize their potential. And I know that there are lots of people out there like that, and I feel fortunate to work with a lot of them at Grace today. So with that philosophy, which I think we all hear in love. We were in the section where here we're talking about challenges. That's not necessarily easy to do. And one of the biggest challenges in the industry is agent turnover. And we just got talking about how important the agent is in creating that experience. And that even with the trends of AI, it's not replacing agents, but a lot of times it's taking over the smaller stuff and the more important meaty stuff that a person needs to address is there. 
So in this environment where the human is actually even maybe more important than it has been in the past, how important is agent turnover and how do you address that challenge? I don't think anyone would argue that keeping your people and keeping them happy is vital. If you are making the level of investment in folks, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into hiring and training and onboarding and the cultural assimilation and getting folks fully onboarded and engaged in what you're doing. So it's massive to keep your great people, coach people, manage them, make sure that they understand that they're accountable for their performance. But for those people who you want and who have a long-term future in a company, you have to be able to offer them something to stick around for. Not just another day of trying to solve 40 to 80 problems in a day, but actually what are the other great things about this organization that you can look forward to as you grow your career. I've worked very hard across every place that I've been to give every opportunity for individual contributors to grow into other roles in the organization. So where I had all of my managers, my QA, all of that, I grew them organically at Capital IQ. And if they didn't stay in my organization, they could grow. They would get tapped and move into a customer success role. At National Debt Relief, when I started with a handful of people, 15 people, that grew into a 160-person organization where I had two managers and team leads. I had levels of leadership of folks that I built them into those roles, legal specialists, admin, all of these different areas where they grew into now. Today, about half of my direct reports at Raisin started off as a frontline agent, thanking folks for calling Raisin and asking how they could help. And these folks have played a big role in the growth and development of the team, and they'll continue to do it. I think you also need your organization to support you. So we have a learning and development budget for employees at Brazen, which helps to retain them. As we've become a larger organization, we're rolling out different levels of individual contributor. We're getting to a point where we can have more specialization around learning and development and quality assurance and data and analytics and all of these other functions that you must have running effectively in order to continue to, to efficiently grow out an organization. So I think a lot of it is about those opportunities for folks to grow their career if you want to keep them in your organization. One of the takeaways from what you just said is what you were generally intending. And that is, I think it was a couple of years ago, Forrester came out and they talked about this gap between managers and agents in trust. Trust to have a little latitude go out of the sequence of here's how you answer this question or that question, right? And give them the ability as they learn to adapt and handle situations in ways that they think is the best. And when people are growing in now like your direct reports, they're going into different areas in the organization. To me, it means that they wanted to stay and they trusted in the organization. Tell me a little bit about trust and agents in that whole process and how you feel about that. If you expect someone on your team to create a great experience for a customer, to come into that interaction in the right headspace, with the right energy, with the right focus, they can't be worried about an absence of support. They can't be at the edge of the diving board wondering if there's enough water to support them when they jump off. They have to know that there's plenty of water and a lifeguard, that there are a number of different ways in which we are supporting folks. And they all have to know that our success is intertwined. I cannot be a success if every leader and every frontline individual contributor is not set up for success every day. So they need to know it. They need to hear it. It has to be a two-way street. You can't just tell people that. You have to show it in your actions. You have to really listen to folks and action the things you can action in order to drive improvements. You have to be smart about change management. And that's incredibly important in a dynamic organization because if given the opportunity, change, 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 change. That's pretty scary when you get asked a question and you're like, I feel like I went to a training and then they talked about it, but I didn't know if it went live yet. So 
change management is also a vital component of this. If you're giving people time and resources and support, then they're going to feel a lot better and feel a lot more trust in you and that organization supporting them to create those great experiences. Much more eloquently said than I've heard it before. That's fantastic. Chris, we've gone over so much and I have a feeling we could probably go on another couple hours, but if there was one single takeaway that you wanted people to have from listening or viewing this podcast, what would that be? That great service can help the success of any business is worthy of the right level of time and investment and can bring that to any organization. If everyone can agree on what you want service to do, if you can have a clear vision of what should service deliver, and then you are focused on putting the right pieces in place in order to bring and deliver that vision. I think it's as worthy of an investment as any other area of the company. And I think if you're a responsible steward of that function, you can accomplish that goal, do it in a cost-effective way, do it in a technically smart way, and add tremendous value to your organization. So I don't think anyone should just sit back and let a team say customer service is just a cost center, customer service is just, it's something we have to do. It's eating our vegetables. Customer service is not just eating your vegetables. Customer service is the seasoning that can make your meal phenomenal. I love it. If people have questions afterwards, is it appropriate if we gave out a link to your LinkedIn profile so they could get a hold of you? Yeah, I'd be more than happy to answer more questions on this stuff. I could talk about this for hours. Well, Chris, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all these insights and lessons learned starting from the ground up. These are lessons that we need to remind ourselves of continually. It's not like you do it in the beginning and then you can forget. This is valuable advice for us, no matter what stage we are in our organization. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve.